you. Um, so my name is Max Rose, as, as you've already been told. I'm the Deputy Director of the London Design Festival, uh, also the author of several books, including the London Design Guide. Um, when Cassie asked me to chair the session today, I, I must admit I sat with her and I went, I don't think I know very much about this world of wearables. And, um, I've been reading a lot more about it recently, but I've got a certain naivety, naivety to it, which I will come clean about right now. Um, but my, maybe that will be quite good for the purposes of this, this discussion today, uh, by virtue of the fact that I might ask some questions that um, some of you might not dare ask. Um, they might be very naive questions, uh, they might be quite probing questions, or they might be quite provocative, or indeed cynical, but let's see where we get to. Um, I'm going to kick off well, we're going to kick off by having just five minutes from each of our panellists, uh, starting with Christopher, who will tell us a bit about what he does. We will then have a discussion after that, so please, over to Christopher. Thank you. Um, so for those of you that know nothing about me at all, that's no trouble. In um, sort of five minutes, I'm just going to talk through um, the last seven years of my life, actually since leaving the Royal College of Art in London. Um, and so... I did my final collection at the Royal College on Inuit survival skills, on layering, on parity, on um, craft to a certain degree, and then how it could be reappropriated into modern sort of contemporary clothing. I work a lot um, with sustainable fabrics. I do a lot of, um, of remade and recycling. Um, so I took this early concept and then it was sort of reinterpreted into the garments you see here. So on the left-hand side, there's a... Um, uh, a, a sort of lightweight parka that's actually made from parachute silk. On the right hand side is a, um, a coat that's made from original 1950s British um, walls. So there's a lot of sort of um, different layerings of archaeology to what I do. And that's sort of the very early start to, um, to the brand for me. The parachute thing really uh, was something I then developed into, um, into a more sort of commercial practice. And so this was the first collection I did when, when leaving the Royal College. It was called Digital Rainbow, and it was all, as I mentioned, produced from original parachute fabric. And it was um, exhibited at uh, the Sustainable Futures exhibition back at the Design Museum. This would have been about 2009, somewhere around about there. And um, I mentioned a little bit about the, the sort of remaking and, and recycling. A large part now of my, my company, um, is still the same as, as when I started it. This remade in England concept has kind of grown. And I spent a lot of my time in military warehouses, uh, researching, finding original garments that then I deconstruct and rework. And so this is a little bit about the process there, like R&D, fairly um, standard. I have a studio now, um, in fact, just the other side of the river in Bow. And then we develop, uh, of course, the collections, prototype things, and then finally the show is now at London Fashion Week. And over the last seven years, as I mentioned, I've gone from those first fairly conceptual ideas to now um, growing the company to having around 65 stockists worldwide. And we deal with, with stores like Colette, Liberty, Harrods, uh, Isatan in Japan, a lot of the best stores, Barney's in the US. And then also, I've been able to sort of develop the concept of Remade and work on collaborations with um, Victor and Ox, for example, who are really famous for the Swiss Army knife. But then also, um, I've, I've been able to sort of experiment a little bit as I've gone. The Remade thing in, in particular has been a catalyst. So the image you see on the left-hand side was taken from a film I made uh, with fire equipment where we deconstructed, reworked it and then actually collaborated with a stuntman who very kindly set himself on fire in our clothing. And I suppose it's a slightly different take on, on the idea of uh, technology, I guess, and wearable technology. And then I've worked also with Montclair, um, Rafa Cycles, Fred Perry. So I've done some, some sort of uh, fairly mixed projects as well over the years, but always trying to keep that same DNA, the same understanding within the company. So hopefully in five minutes, that's sort of seven years of my life. So, there we go. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Christopher. You said you use all existing materials? Um, what's, what's now happened, actually, I mentioned a lot about the parachute thing and, and this remade concept. 
we worked still a, predominantly with, uh, with either reused or recycled fabric. Um, but what's actually happened as the company has developed is we've had an opportunity to uh, sort of grow the, the concept and to work with Japanese recycled fibres, for example, rather than just 50 or 60 year old parachutes. And there's something quite nice about that, that sort of two pronged approach, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's hear from Steph. Uh, you have a, a five-minute presentation for us as well, I believe. I think you might need to change it. Please the um, presentation. Uh, yeah. While that happens, uh, <coughs> Christopher, do you uh, embrace wearables and technologies into your clothing? Well, it, I mean, it's funny. I, um, I think that can... When I was at the Royal College, I did projects with Umbro based around photonics and you know all of these things and shape memory alloys and all of this. So I have quite a good understanding of some of the more advanced technologies that you, that you can be using. But the reality is that for me, it's about finding the right balance as well. And ultimately, I need to have a product that someone's going to be able to wear and afford. Importantly, so there's actually limits as well to what I can do as a designer because of the production methods, because of the technology going into things. So um, I kind of look at it a, a different way. For example, even what I'm wearing here, this is a Swiss-made fabric. It's a four-way stretch, uh, water-resistant fabric, which has a completely unique print. And so that's, of course, very technologically advanced, but it's maybe a slightly different way of looking at things. No, you have, and that's interesting. We'll come on to that in a second when, when the two, we get you both talking together. But let's hear from the next step. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Steph. I'm one of the founders of um, uh, Makeshift. It's a new company I set up a year ago. And my background is software. So I think the reason that Cassie has put us on a stage together, never having met or had a conversation together, is that um, we, between us, represent um, the kind of clash and the point where fashion and technology meet. And I think because we haven't really done much uh, in, that, in that area ourselves. Perhaps it, this is a discussion about um, what it's like to think about those kinds of collaborations. So that's what I thought I'd just give you a, a, a bit of a rundown on. Um, I started in software back in the day, um, coding away on a computer when I was, I was little. Um, but I always wanted to combine design and uh, technology in some way. I set up a, an agency a few years ago, and I got, got a little bit bored of uh, time for hire, doing great work for other people and then not really owning it afterwards. And so my new company is really about uh, setting up a studio where we get to work on our own ideas and we don't have any clients, which sounds a little bit crazy. Um, it's high risk and we have a model which is based on the concept of a startup studio. So the, if you imagine a kind of startup incubator where you have uh, lots of companies and then investors and all that sort of stuff, we're trying to take the best of that world and the best of you know, what the design studios of the world uh, have as their practice and kind of mash it together into a new, new model. And over the last year, in our little room here with 11 of us, uh, we've made uh, 11 digital products and it's on the web and you can't wear the web. Uh, so I thought I would show you some stuff that wasn't the web um, because my uh, principle um, is hack, play, learn. That's my general uh, mode of operating, that's the way that I find that I'm best, um, and I've been given the, this uh, job, job title of hacker by those around me. I didn't choose it as a, as a way to kind of represent who I am, but it's, it's my approach. I like to do things very quickly. I like to have an idea and then very, very rapidly get something out that someone else can play with and learn from that play. So that's a loop that I kind of developed over the last few years. Um, and that manifests itself when I go to hack days um, and now in the practice of my company. But a hack day, if you're unfamiliar, is where you, you get a bunch of people together for a weekend and rapidly make something in the space of 24 to 36 hours uh, with a, some kind of public demonstration of what you've made. So I thought I'd show you some stuff I've made at hack days because that's more fun than showing you websites. Um, this is the first thing, well, other than designing Vivian Westwood's website randomly, uh, uh, as my big break, um, the year tech, this is the first thing I've done in fashion, I guess, and I think it's probably the reason that Cassie asked me here. Um, 
I went to uh, a hack day and I was a bit bored of doing those hack days where you just do something on a screen and I thought wouldn't it be great to do something that represents data uh, in a physical way. And so this is my wife's Twitter stream, analysed for the instance of the word love over time and then turned into a laser cut, laser etched necklace, it's called the data necklace. Um, and uh, you can see this writing down inside, and there's the actual tweets uh, that she made in, in, a, in a thousand tweets uh, period that represents. Um, and I did this as a hack day, and it went down pretty well. I also did another one uh, at the same event, um, and this is the death necklace, and it visualizes instances of people speaking about death on Twitter uh, for a 47 day period. Uh, there are various APIs available that allow you to listen for this sort of stuff. And I thought it was very strange that somewhere, somewhere in the world is a robot scraping people's comments about death and, and sort of morbid. But I turned it around because on the side here you can't see, but each of these I picked out the um, name of someone whose obituary was published that day. And the size of each bead is programmatically generated based on the kind of the noise around that person. So. Uh, Neil Armstrong here knocked out two days. There wasn't even anyone published the second day. Um, it's quite interesting, and it was a wearable, um, wearable representation. And then uh, this year I went on and I made something um, taking that idea of data and privacy uh, a little bit further. And this is uh, something called cryptographics, and I came up with a visual language that enabled you to turn any kind of information into a series of triangles with four different colours. And then again, I laser cut it out of the material, but I also just came up, made it so that you can just generate these things on a website. So this represents my PIN number for my, car, for my credit card, um, and I turned it into something that looks like an IKEA print that you can put in, on your wall in your home. And so the idea was, what could you do about taking very, very, very private information and then putting it in a public place with cryptography around it? So it just looks seemingly normal. And then I made this T-shirt. <laughs> See what I've done here. And this is all of my credit card details. So I'm wearing them. And then the other day I was in the FT, and I hacked the FT uh, by putting my credit card details directly into the picture so that you could decode them out of it. And I've not told them that, so you're the first people to hear that. Um, so I like playing and hacking and making things that are a little bit comment worthy uh, with, with this stuff, but I've definitely not done anything for money. I don't make a living from doing things where technology and fashion meet. I guess that maybe is the point where we uh, start a conversation. So you've got about half an hour to see if you can decode this t shirt. <laughs> um, Have a go. And, and maybe we can get all this credit card and we'll be off. Um, so thank you both. Thank you both for explaining a bit about what you do. Um, it's interesting, your, the, neck, the love necklace we talked about uh, was a manifestation of data into something physical. Have you? created any wearables that have integrated technologies within them that are measuring anything to do with our surroundings, to do with our well-being, or anything like that? It's the logical next, next step, I think. Um, I, I, lots of conversations came out of that piece of work around data physicality, um, because data is something that you can't hold, really. Um, if you're lucky, you can turn something into an object that represents something that has um, uh, kind of data representation. But uh, the, at the moment, there's a kind of a cut between what's in the real world and what's online. And I thought, what can you do if you merge the two? Obviously, you you should now be able to do things that in some way merge that. So the next step for the data necklace would be something that has that is a live representation of some some, some data. And um, some friends of mine, uh, Keith Circuit, represent uh, that kind of movement. They came up with an idea of the, the, the Twitter dress, where they uh, a series of LEDs are woven into fabric, and then you, via Bluetooth, you can fire messages at it, and you end up in this very strange state where you're wearing the messages from complete strangers, which is quite an interesting thing. I think there's more to be done there, and that might be the way the way things go, but um, it's very hard, and really expensive to experiment with and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me, and forgive me if I sound cynical, but an example like that seems a bit kind of conceptual, kind of like what's why would I want to read? Why would I want to wear and portray everyone else's Twitter streams on my garment? Why would you want to wear your Twitter feed around your neck? I mean, yeah, I mean, what's, um, what kind of what's the point of it? Why are we doing all this stuff? Um, <laughs> somebody asked me that the other day after the, the, the cryptographics project, and I just said because art. Uh, <laughs> is that the way you see it? Just, is, is it artwork? Is it? Is it? Why not? An expression um, of. I think you can do interesting things with by exploring 
in an area where you don't try and make money from, money from it or make a living from it. Mm. Um, and you know, interesting things emerge. Um, I don't think everything has to have a. I, I think. I mean, my interest is always around the function, ultimately. Mm. And if a technology, you know, is bringing an additional function to a garment or to, to your experience, then it's a worthwhile activity, I think. And um, I, I suspect, you know, we're, we're coming from slightly different points of view again, and that's that's exactly the point. But um, yeah, for me, the only real need to be to be pushing those sort of conceptual things is ultimately if it's going to improve the garment. Mm -hmm. Improving the value or the quality or the, the wearability, and, and that's sort of the, the balance for me mm -hmm. as a designer. And is there any functionality that you're interested to incorporate into your garments through wearable technologies? Well, I think, I mean, again, as I touched on earlier, through when I think about sustainability, there's rafts of things that I would love to be doing with my own brand, but we just do not have the logistics, the infrastructure, the, the finances behind it. When I look at um, examples like Patagonia, where you can send back your garment, you know, they'll completely recycle it into something new. Or even if you look at some of the new technology with Nike and with the Flynet, you know, the, these types of innovations that ultimately, I mean, that when I think about wearable technology, those sort of brands are really, really exciting. And so I, I think as well that as a young designer, the reason I sort of highlighted some of the collaborations. I kind of see that uh, the opportunity or even the, the obligation is to be working at points with bigger brands where you have the opportunity to bring some of your creativity but then work with their logistics and things as well. And I think, again, that, that's something really important to me personally. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it strikes me that the, the technology is leaping forward all the time, of course, and we see this all the time, and, and miniaturization of the technologies, mm. more sophistication, durability, all these kind of things that enable more discrete uh, integration into our wearables, for example. Because, you know, if you think about wearables that exist already, they're quite clunky and, and evident. So there are certain industries that have embraced wearables, wearable technologies, if you like, for, for a long time, traffic wardens, police, fire services, paramedics, um, spies, in a more discreet yeah. way. Um, artificial fibre enthusiasts in the sports world is very much, and the yeah. Nike fit you mentioned. Um, but what about fashion? Because everyone's saying that the future of these technologies is the that fashion, the fashion world embraces it. Um, you know, there are th there was something said. Somebody told me that three high-profile fashion designers have been hired by Apple in advance of their iWatch, uh, and indeed, according to Wired, the latest issue of Wired, which I have here, which I've been reading. Um, <laughs> Uh, t uh, 2014 will be the year of wearables. Um, so the technology world needs a fashion world. Do, do you do you agree with that? Do either of you agree with that statement? Uh, there's definitely something going on. I mean, we've got uh, Google Glass about to hit the market. That's going to do interesting things. Um, the, the watch that everyone keeps talking about coming from Apple, and there's a, the, the, these kind of wrap around screens that are, are going to be out soon. You know, these these things are going to drive. Uh, new ways that you uh, access information. I mean, they're, they're, the way they're being marketed, the way we think about them is devices. The devices to do. Um, they're not necessarily devices to wear, they're or to represent you in some way. And I think that's a fundamental difference. Yeah. That, um, the way I dress is sending a signal or that's you know, how I want to represent myself to others. But I don't do things with my jacket. I don't do. There's no do about it. I'm wearing it. It's keeping me warm with it. But Sort of thing that it does. Whereas a device that you wrap around your wrist that shows you things or enables you to you know, use Siri to do voice commands, things like that, that's an action. Um, I, was, I was thinking about this um, in advance of this uh, conversation. I personally have quite a, um, uh, a blunt way of deciding what I work on. Um, so it makes sure that all the projects that we do, we, we focus on, um, are things that we would consider using ourselves every day. So we design things for ourselves that we use, and if we like the thing we've made, then we release it to other people. Now, I, I, I guess I have trouble thinking of something right now that I personally can actually develop or make myself. I'm going to make part of my clothing. I might build stuff on top of a platform that someone's So when this watch comes out, 
there'll be all sorts of weird, wonderful apps that will come out and they enable you to do things in, in new ways. Um, but I'm not sure I'm yet going to be wet, kind of wiring things into my clothing, that kind of thing. So I think there's a, a distinction about, for a technologist, where you see yourself being part of that. So for me, it'd be about function. So what, can you, what pain am I going to solve by having something attached to my body in some way, with permanently there, or with some, in some way connected to the internet or other devices? What, what is the use case? And everyone always talks about what's the killer app. Um, I guess we're going to find out when Google released the class, because something strange is going to happen there. Now I can definitely see a case there for pain being solved. And I guess I can see some pain being solved by a watch, um, but maybe I don't know enough about what other people are talking about that's coming next after that, and probably me having a position of ignorance on you know, what, is what is possible when you start emerging fashion technology. I, uh, I'll be quite straightforward. I don't believe that 2014 will see a massive, you know, <laughs> massive change for most, you know, people on the street, most customers. <coughs> it's journalism, don't worry about it. <laughs> I've heard about it. Um, but then, I think as well, always uh, at the military, the way that everything is um, often. Uh, you know, the, the catalysts often come through the military, through sports, where all of these different things, and it, it sort of eventually things get adopted into, um, into mainstream culture. And again, I think, um, while on the one hand, maybe, you know, for, for some people, wearable technology is all about electronics, for me, again, I, I still come back to the function, and just thinking about uh, some of the, the breakthroughs, even in uh, wicking fabrics or in... You know, all of these different things that can be antibacterial, all of that side of things that I think is so relevant. And actually, you know, people are buying it in M and S every day. So we can kind of we can think about things that way as well. So I, I, for me again it's still that balance and I think for me as a designer, showing up London fashion, the idea of thinking that, okay, next season, wow, I should be doing you know, these integrated uh, outfits where technologies, work, you know, that's so far off the mark for me as a, as a designer. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of my, my honest take on it. So is, is the issue now about convergence that actually your two worlds are perhaps not talking to each other about the possibilities and that there's actually huge fruits for collaboration uh, and by knowing each other's processes you'll be able to create some very interesting it's whatever like you, you need a three-way collaboration mm. because um, you can't bring something to market mm. as uh, you know a little in indie like, like, like we are. Sure. Yeah. Um, you do need the kind of large brand behind you. And we have London. You know, London is a kind of hotbed for that stuff. So th I do think there's something going to pop out of London, um, and that we will see something and look back and go, oh, of course, that was the year that that happened. And I think there will be something that emerges where you get a big brand who sees that this this is going on, it isn't Apple, and it isn't a technology company, but maybe is an, an enabler and has uh, access to a, you know, a production uh, you know, pipeline for the sort of stuff and distribution. Um, so I guess the, the thing that I think could possibly happen is someone stepping in and saying we're going to sponsor some collaboration between these two worlds and then see what emerges, but it would be pretty high risk venture money, I mean it would you know, probably would get nothing in back from it. Um, but I think that that's probably something so then, that should happen in London at the moment. I think long term, uh, that's something that has to happen, ultimately, along with sort of localised manufacturing, all of these different things. And I say, for me as a designer, even if I do look at that amazing, um, you know, photonic jacket, whatever, there's no way I can produce it. And, you know, the production at the moment, a lot of it's in Asia, or it's in, uh, so far away from, from where I'm at. But if I... I start to think long term about hopefully the future of fashion, and therefore potentially you know integrated uh, technology, fabrications, everything else. Then you start to think about local manufacturing as well, and, and so it's a step by step thing. But ultimately, the, the next steps, as you mentioned, I think are relatively high risk for whoever's um, going to take them. The high risk would possibly have quite a, uh, a big return if you look at what happens with um, uh, Makerbot in the states. Mm -hmm. Makerbot, I was at its um, South by Southwest 
conference, I don't know, a few, five years ago, not long enough ago to be, uh, for these numbers to make sense. Um, and Makerbot with this, these guys with this wooden 3D printer in a pretty wacky uh, room yeah. with loads of LEDs and robots, and you know, it, it totally came out of the Maker, uh, Maker scene that popped out at that time. Uh, and you look now, and they're worth $300 million. I think something similar <coughs> is, is what we're talking about here, that in order to actually be able to experiment with stuff, you need to have a certain uh, degree of um, uh, ability to produce small prototypes that you could, you could sell. Mm. Um, and at the moment, I think that you, because the that production is all uh, overseas, there's a, there's a barrier there. In fact, it's definitely a barrier for me wanting to go into this area and do experimentation, because I can't see how I can do anything but art through it. So mm. I enjoy playing. Um, it's what's the person getting serious? How do you how do you make that transition? Um, I mean, you're talking about the high investment, and I understand that. Of course, with time, um, the technology has become cheaper and more ubiquitous. Uh, are, is there anything that's around right now that is perhaps cheaper and more uh, more available that will uh, that you've got your eye on that will enable some very creative spin-offs? Um, you know, whatever they may be. <coughs> I, I, for me, I think, um, although it's probably quite a, uh, an obvious one, now I think 3D printing, you know, has, has reached the point where it's becoming relatively affordable. Mm. You know, and the next steps there are, are pretty exciting. Again, I come back to how hypothetically that could work with, with recycle, where you could take your, uh, you know, your synthetic jacket, you know, you can mulch that and you can reprint it. You know, these types of things. Which at the moment, you know, if you'd said that probably ten years ago, that's that would be pretty wacky. Whereas now, you know, it's very close to being to being doable. And so, but for me, that would be a, a quite a clear, manageable thing that might happen in the next five years, for example. I know a lot of people are now getting very excited about low energy polluting, and um, I think that could be quite both revolutionary because you do. Uh, have the possibility of having things that, that last for a long time without having to be charged that do communications from device to device. Um, and when you start doing that, then, you, then you're then you looking at uh, the ability to just leave things running. And so you could buy small units, and then you could basically build a platform of units of things that do tasks or mm. lots of things um, that are based on that technology. I, um, I know that I've mentioned Cute Circuit twice now, but those guys are experimenting with with wearables that use that technology because you know, they want the first people to get to it. Um, that could be very interesting. But then it needs the use case. It needs the why, why do you want to be monitoring your um, home security system from your coats? Well, exactly. I mean, that's a that, that's the question that I keep coming back to my head. It seems kind of lunacy. Why do we need all of this information fed to us in all these different ways? I mean, arguably, we're doing it already through our phones and the act of pulling out your phone and looking at whatever you're looking at. But sooner or later, that's all going to be kind of supposedly integrated so that nobody else notices what we're doing, but we're being fed the state all the time. Presumably, though, you're, Why you're do we feel get, the need for that? You're going to get a giant reaction to, to exactly that. You know, when I go running, I don't, I don't want to run with a phone or a watch or anything. Mm. You know, I, just, I, I run because I want to run with, with nothing. It's so nice to be free. Mm. And so again, you know, I, I start to realize that part of me probably being here today, do people really ultimately want to be wired up and, you know, completely connected to, to everything all the time? You know, and that's, that's the other thing. There are lots of people who love doing that, though. The, um, the, these, these little devices you can buy in the uh, um, you know, technology stores for 50 quid that you wear around US. I bought one uh, mm -hmm. recently. Um, and, you know, that was, that was a really interesting experiment to so what did, wear, what did wear you something all, all day. Sorry. What, what did you buy? So um, it was one of those little wristbands that you yeah. wear that tells you your pole not when you're alive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it, it, did have an old, it did alter my behaviour slightly. I found that interesting. So I was wearing this device. It was monitoring how many steps I was taking per day. Um, and then there's a, an iPhone app that shows you a graph over time. What you should, what the national average is, which is surprisingly low, um, and you know, name for. Um, and I found that uh, it just told me that, oh great, you're doing 3,000 more steps than what you should be aiming for every day. Great. 
And, 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 to you. I mean, and I didn't need to wear it again. I, I, say, I, I, that's picked, a novelty. I picked, I picked my, my little boy up in one arm and it popped up and snapped. Um, and I, I didn't replace it. I, I, thought, I, I loved the thing, so I was plugging in every day and I loved the kind of ceremony of checking the data and everything. Then when it actually came down to why was I wearing it, I couldn't, I couldn't really see. I mean, it was, it was monitoring my sleep. I, I don't know, if you, have, if you have kids, you don't need something to monitor your sleep because you're not having any. Um, <laughs> and that wasn't the use case. And because I was generally living a relatively healthy existence, um, I didn't need to make a change. Now, some people who, you know, who don't, um, don't have that might have done exactly what I did. So I, 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 st I stopped getting uh, the bus down the road and I walked. So the, the, the change in behavior was interesting then. So it was more like wearing the device altered how I acted. Sure. And it might be we see some more of that. So, you know, maybe um, sensors that are just monitoring your general health and maybe they, they help you adapt to your lifestyle in some way. I think there's huge health benefits mm. that could come out of that. Can I maybe read you some examples of more possibilities? This is, this is from the latest issue of Diet. Um, and it's sort of slightly whimsical, but I'll just, I'll just read from this if you don't know, you know mind. Um, never forget a name again, thanks to its camera, facial recognition tech, and a link to your social networks. Never be lost through the map hovering in the corner of your eye. Develop an instant expertise in the art you're looking at, the reverse image search, and a Wikipedia lookup. Have perfect memories of everything you do, say, see, or hear through a constant archive of point of view shot from your forehead. Be a more scintillating conversationalist by recording, transcribing, and automatically Googling everything you hear. Link your devices and adjust your day's agenda to match your pulse rate, monitored stress levels. Receive an amb ambient alert to your wrist whenever you're close to something that's on your phone's stored shopping list and whisper to your glasses to show you where it is on the shelf. Feel a tingle in your pocket when you walk past someone whose OkCupid okay profile matches your own, whose biomonitoring devices indicate it is in a receptive mood. Automatically plot a route to work that takes you past breakfast places whose menus match your immediate biochemical needs and have this hover in front of you as you cycle, with warnings for what you're pedaling for when you're pedaling too hard for your heart, and notifications of upcoming meetings being cancelled as you sub-vocalize acknowledgments in English, having them translated in real time into the Japanese of your colleague's wrist-bound diary. <laughs> anyone else anyone up for that? <laughs> oh we have a question. So I'd like to share two things. One is my reaction to that, mm. and the other is a tangible example of wearable technology that came out of um, Noisebridge, the San Francisco hacker space, um, that I haven't seen anyone playing with since. Um, so the first is the reaction to that, which is that what we there is an awful lot of judgment presupposed in the suggestions being subliminally and semi-liminally delivered in that scenario. Um, now, if that is impeccably good judgment made in my favor, then that's probably going to be life-enhancing. However, looking at the trends of, of, of uh, the way that these uh, um, big data-backed, densely connected services are working at the moment, it's probably not going to be only made in my interest. Those judgments are going to be made with just enough of my interest that I don't get thoroughly pissed off and stop using the service, but a lot more interest of the commercial sponsors for you know the re whatever the revenue model is for for you know has the breakfast place subscribed to the push advertising service to get people in through the door you know so the little the little in the easy place that I actually want to visit doesn't doesn't sign up and I get diverted to McDonald's. Or if not McDonald's, then something kind of corporate, but yeah, we have to be really careful if we're gonna wear this stuff and allow it to become subconscious, to become um, automatic, that it doesn't supplant our current fallible personal judgment with a sort of perverse judgment a judgment that doesn't serve our actual volition, that, however good, actually serving another set of goals, maybe very skillfully. So now onto the, uh, the piece of hardware 
that I actually see people wearing. It, this is a prosthetic sense of direction. So they had a wrist, and they had an ankle band with the with an electronic compass, very simple microcontroller, and a bunch of little vibrators that pressed against the skin, and it would every few seconds it would give you a tiny pulse um, on the one that was closest to north, and very quickly you stopped noticing them, and you didn't. Apparently, the people who wore them consistently said after a while they didn't even notice it being there. But, and they didn't notice explicitly knowing where North was, but they did notice that they were never lost. So wandering around unfamiliar city streets, they never got disorientated. Unfamiliar buildings still never got disorientated. It was actually substantially useful while being totally unintrusive. And why do you think there's not been an uptake? Expensive I think it's because um, nobody took this slightly funky, slightly fragile, utterly bespoke craft object and converted it into something that was consumable, where there was a story, like the narrative I've just given you, where there was a product that could just be bought, which would you know, last at least as long as your wristband that stayed on for you know, some weeks, I guess, before it broke. You know, this thing was, it was hand-sewn out of fabric and good fact of thread and fragile as all hell and totally unwashable and, you know, probably had to be charged once a day. And this is brilliant, but it, again, it highlights for me a, a giant or potential looming problem. No one knows how to do anything anymore because, you, you know, you, uh, you look up your Google map and all of this, you know, the idea that people generally can't you know, find their way around or that you know, no one knows how to cook anymore, the, these types of things, because you just look up a recipe. And over time, you kind of lose craft, basically. And it kind of comes back to the beginning of the, the presentation, and sort of the reason that every time I start a new collection, I, I really try and research as much as I can about original crafts and original ways of doing things and then mixing it with new fabrications and things because this sort of thing scares the hell out of me. Yeah, and I have to agree, it, it scares the hell out of me too, but maybe, maybe it frees up your mind to not worry about certain things that we do spend a lot of time trying to find out. Mm. Um, so maybe it actually allows you to focus more on your craft by pushing these other things away a bit more. The noise of life. I like the noise. Yeah. What do you think? I think those, those examples you gave there, um, I can see that some of them would be generally useful and people would, would be able to use that kind of yep. intrusion or part of, being part of their uh, every day. Um, I, 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 I often listen to what the, you know, why they're talking about in the publication and think that's kind of one possible future over that way. But there's, in, every, in every time you see one of these articles, there's an equivalent and uh, equal backlash uh, potential. And um, so the, what, what we're talking about here is the people who just reject this idea. Um, and that's a future, but it's not something that's generally talked about very much. The, the, you know, there are people who just go, well, oh, that's not for me, I'm not, I'm not doing that, I don't agree with it. It's the people who yeah. aren't on Facebook. Yeah. You know, there's no one who really writes about them. Well, they're, you know, they're there, and they, they react against the kind of big brother feel of, of the place. Um, about go, you know, go, I call it, um, it, it's a thing uh, at your house party, your dad listening the door. Um, it's, that, it's that kind of feeling. Like, what, how much am I giving away and so on? So there are people who now, because of privacy, are very, <coughs> and privacy revelations, are, are a little bit more cynical about this stuff as well, even though kind of the full-on um, techno-utopianists are well, hang on, actually, there's a bit of a problem here. How much am I giving away? And I think that, kicking in at the same time as this stuff, is a, bit, a real problem for yeah. adoption. And, and in fairness, in this article, he does counter that, right. these things with that movement, which is uh, more and more people saying, I don't actually want this connectivity anymore, rejecting their Facebook accounts and it, it know, be, stripping it away, stripping it out. It would be smarter to invest in a uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and 3G blocker. Uh, it's a box you install in public places. It yeah. just wipes out everything, yeah. everyone around. Or small yeah. EMP post devices yeah. or, you know, all or whatever. Sudden, all of a sudden we all go at that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a lovely device that I've seen that is, a, this is a brilliant example of uh, wearable technology, um, and you can just buy this 
little kit for twenty dollars, I think it is. Um, and all it does is it, 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 it's, it's called TV TV V1, and it, it's a little device that has all of the off signals for all TVs uh, in the world. Um, and you press a button, and it just cycles through them all in order of frequency. So eventually, any screen nearby will just turn off. And somebody sews one of these devices into a into their jacket, and then put some conductive circuit uh, down the front. So when they did the zip up, it just turned off all the screens. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Because I, I can actually imagine myself yeah. doing that. Yeah. And that, those little slightly funny, comment-worthy things, I think, would probably where I'll start. I, yeah. I'd probably do. I'd probably do that.